Well, hello and welcome. My name is Winston Lee. I'm one of the faculty physicians here at UNC School of Medicine, in case we haven't met before. And I'm so happy and excited to welcome you to the UNC Academy of Educators, Frank Wilson Professionalism Forum. This is one of the Academy's hallmark events uh, for the year. We do this annually, and this is a time to really reflect and honor that medical ideal of professionalism. Thinking about the attitudes, behavior of physicians, of thinking about things like humanism, accountability, and personal and professional growth for, for all of us in this business that we do. And I hope and I really believe that our speaker today will bring life to those ideals and, and, and platitudes and hopefully uh, leave you inspired and reflective of how you might really bring those uh, ideals to life in your own practice. By way of introducing um, Dr. Frank Wilson, who of course is the namesake for our event, please allow me to play a video to show you a little bit about his life and work and uh, his connection to our medical school. So I'll share my screen and let me play a brief video to showcase Dr. Wilson and his legacy here at UNC. And someone I'm sure will tell me if the video or audio is not working. What do you think makes a good teacher? Commitment. Dr. Frank C. Wilson was born in Rome, Georgia, and graduated from the Darlington School of Vanderbilt University, and later the Medical College of Georgia. After a residency and fellowship in orthopedics at the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City, he joined the faculty of the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in 1964. I became chief in 1960. Seven. We came here and joined the faculty in 64, and I became uh, chief of orthopedics in 67. But uh, yeah, I taught literature for about 20 years. Uh, also, during that time, I had to balance my time commitment because I was teaching <clears throat> to college students. We start with one of the literary figures most known to this institution, Thomas Wolfe. That's right. And, and uh, uh, we, we emphasize him in the course, but also have expand, had expanded it into the uh, other, all literature, but mostly American literature. Dr. Wilson has taught over 6,000 students and directed the education of more than 100 residents. And what did you love about teaching? Well, the opportunity to impart your knowledge and experience that I thought would be of some value to the students that I was teaching, seeing the value of reading 2,000 first edition books right here. He has authored or co-authored nearly 200 publications, 31 dealing with education and several books, including a play based on the works of Thomas Wolfe. Did that love of reading uh, influence your practice of medicine in any way, you think? There were situations that I encountered in the books and they did too, that had medical aspects to mm -hmm. it. And so they were able to benefit from medically some of the materials. I'm in the process of trying to finish my 15th book. My eyes have gotten much worse. Judy was given some annual talk. Right a big deal. Yeah. 
But Anne is a great help. She, I dictate here, and she takes it off the machine. And between us, we get it out. The Frank C. Wilson Professionalism Day, generously funded by Dr. Wilson since 2011, is held annually by the UNC Academy of Educators to promote discussion and learning around professionalism, particularly as it applies to medical education. So when you and Anne gave this money to the Academy of Educators for the Professionalism Forum, do you have any recollection of why you did that? I just thought it was important. And I wanted to donate to some something that the university had done a lot for me. And uh, this was just impartial repayment for, for what they did for me. Anything that you think about Dr. Wilson that made him successful as a teacher, would you say? Well, always it was hard work first. And then I think he just has an innate desire to share information. And that's... If something has really helped you in some way, you'd, you'd like to make it available for others to be helped to it. All right, well, thank you for your attention and hopefully that gives you a little bit of context for our namesake, Dr. Frank Wilson, for this event and what we really hope to celebrate and promote in this session. Well, let me quickly then move on to introduce our, our speaker today. I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Joseph Stern, neurosurgeon and author uh, to our virtual UNC uh, room today. Dr. Stern did his undergraduate medical school and residency training, I believe, at the University of Michigan, and he currently serves as a neurosurgeon at the Cone Brain Tumor Program in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I had several colleagues who came to me to really speak so highly of his work in teaching and in really talking about empathy. And I know that he has a very compelling personal story to share about those qualities that I think really resonate with Dr. Wilson's vision on, on professionalism and hopefully inspiring um, folks like us in the medical education world. So Jody, I'm so grateful and honored you accepted our invitation. And at last, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Winston. I'm going to uh, put up some slides in a minute. I'm, what I wanted to do, I'm giving two talks, and one is going to be about um, my book and about uh, empathy and compassion, and the other is about uh, burnout and ways to prevent it in our practice. Um, and I am delighted uh, to be here. Let me just pull up my slides here. So everyone can see those. Good. All right. Yes. So, that's good. so let me hold on one second. I've got to get. Uh, it's not advancing. Let me see. Okay. So this is this is a. It is an honor to be, be giving the Frank Wilson talk. I asked Winston about Dr. Wilson because I didn't really know anything about him, and it and it strikes me that uh, he's a. He's a role model and a mentor I am glad to now have <laughs> because he's done a lot of the things that I want, which is, you know, getting increasing humanity, increasing compassion in medical care, uh, and also the, his love of literature. So it's, it's a delight. So the first uh, talk I'm going to be giving is Grief Connects Us, Empathy, Compassion, and Emotional Agility in Medicine. And then the second will be Preventing Burnout in Neurosurgical Practice, Palliative Care, International Medicine and teaching. So the first talk is about uh, empathy, compassion, and emotional agility in the practice of medicine. So I want to thank a bunch of people. So I want to thank Winston, Bert Fields in, in uh, Greensboro, Lindsay, who I talked with a while ago, along with Ken, who uh, 
has really encouraged me on this journey. I, initially, I did a TED talk and then had a um, talk with a bunch of um, uh, UNC medical students afterwards. Uh, Frank and Anne, and I apologize for the misspelling of Anne's name. So give you a little background on me. So I trained at University of Michigan in neuros, first in medical school, then in uh, neurosurgery. Uh, and then I, uh, so did medical, yeah, undergrad medical school and then neurosurgery. And I've been in practice in uh, a large group practice in Greensboro, uh, Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates. I've written a bunch, um, including articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, World Neurosurgery, J Journal of Palliative Medicine and the book. Um, and I've been teaching med uh, UNC medical students. I'm now adjunct faculty. I uh, have medical students rotating with me, and we've also started a medical humanities program in Greensboro with the third year medical students throughout their time uh, with us. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit in the second talk. So this book um, is entitled uh, Grief Connects Us, A Neurosurgeon's Lessons on Love, Loss, and Compassion. And I'll tell my story about how I kind of uh, had a very uh, reorienting experience in my life that kind of reshaped me and got me thinking differently. Uh, and it takes me through the uh, experience of my younger sister, Victoria, who developed uh, leukemia. Uh, so I was uh, early, about 50. She was a uh, about, uh, I would guess I was 52, she was about 50. At any rate, um, she was diagnosed, Victoria was diagnosed with acute uh, myelogenous leukemia, had to have a bone marrow transplant, uh, and then later died from her illness. And I saw what it was like as if for the first time, what it's like to be a patient and how everything that I had assumed I knew and that I thought I practiced with compassion, I recognized uh, that I really didn't fully grasp uh, the impact of illness and uh, both on me and on patients. This is a picture from when we were children. And we grew up in London uh, for several years. And this is us walking down uh, Kensington Palace Garden. Uh, I, you know, we drifted apart. You, you grow up until you're 18 and then everybody moves apart. She went to Los Angeles, became an actress. I became a neurosurgeon, moved to North Carolina. Victoria wrote in a journal of her illness um, and she initially wanted this to be a one woman play about surviving leukemia. In fact, it became a journal about her illness and her later death. But I got to see very closely what it was like to be a patient from her eyes. And it was really very reorienting. I had a lot of difficulty uh, working on distance and how to maintain um, detachment and yet also to um, develop empathy. And so that's a lot about what my journey is about. This was from her journal. She was basically in the hospital um, in Los Angeles for eight months, uh, was shut off from the outside world, uh, shut off from her family, had to have a bone, bone marrow transplant, you know, filtered air. And, and she wrote about what that was like. So I saw from my sister's experience, she went into the hospital, you know, they shaved her head, uh, she was in a gown. She was hooked up to all these IV pumps. She used to call this her stalker. So she basically spent her entire time connected to all these IVs. And I saw as if for the first time what it was like for her to be a patient uh, and kind of this is the person that everybody knew in the hospital, shaven head in a gown, not really uh, uh, the person that she started as. and. Few people knew her as the vibrant, vital actress, uh, full of life and full of uh, passion. And even fewer knew her as the little girl that I knew, loved, and grew up with. And I recognized in this moment, uh, sort of a personal transformation, that this was actually the experience of every single patient. We're all like this. First of all, first of all, we're not immune. We can't put up barriers. We are all going to be patients ourselves at some time or other, but that every patient we take care of has these qualities. And a lot of times when we strip them of our, their identities and their dignity and put them in a hospital gown and uh, don't really know their history, uh, it, 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 it does create some distance, but it also deprives us, deprives them of their identity, deprives us of greater understanding of who they are. So it was as if I went from seeing in black and white to suddenly seeing in color. This is a picture I took in over in a hot air balloon over the Serengeti. Uh, and this is what it looks like in color. So it's kind of a light bulb moment for me. 
So a year and a half after my sister died following her bone marrow transplant, her husband, Pat, had, who is now the father of their two children, had a ruptured cerebral aneurysm and went into a coma, and he also died. This is their family in better times. Nick is the boy uh, to the left of my sister. He was the bone marrow donor for his mother and then also did CPR on his father when he collapsed after working out with him. And that's Will, and that was their family. So I saw as if, uh, again, what it was like to suddenly be in the realm of neurosurgical care. You know, this is, a, this is the kind of care that I have spent a career rendering for people, treating people with ruptured aneurysms uh, and doing all the technical aspects. And I saw that what it was like to be on the receiving end was just shocking. And I, I really had no idea how awful it was to be a patient. I realized that we uh, surround ourselves with emotional armor. And this is something that we do from the, from the beginnings of our training, where we, you know, one of my uh, friends said, it starts with your anatomy class where you dissect a patient or you dissect a person, you develop distance, you develop uh, a thick skin, some kind of um, defenses. The problem is this emotional armor, I realized, isn't something you can turn on or put on and take off. It's something that when you put that on, it becomes kind of a shield from a lot of life's experiences and the richness of life's experiences. And I recognized that the emotional armor is actually a burden, and I wanted to get rid of it. So I didn't know what to put in its place. I also recognized the compassion, which means to suffer with really has to drive our care. But we have to be able to flex between extremes of emotions. You know, for example, if I'm uh, feeling connected to a patient and I and their story touches me and I cry with them, how am I going to then go into the operating room and be able to, you know, put that shield up and cut them open and do things to their brain? Uh, how do I do that? How do I become compassionate, allow myself to be compassionate, put away the armor, but be able to do my job and function? It takes 17 seconds to establish empathy. A lot of times it's as simple as sitting and looking in someone's eyes and connecting with them. And it really, what it really comes down to, a lot of people say, well, I don't have time to have an empathetic relationship with a patient. The reality is we're defended against it and we don't want to go there because allowing yourself to connect with someone really doesn't take much time. And what I came to recognize is actually investing that time in making a connection, particularly initially in a relationship with a patient, pays off in, in, in spades. You spend you you have once you establish that connection, you don't have to worry about uh, remaking it the next time because people know you and trust you and know that you're on their side. So Brene Brown uh, in her TED talk talked about the power of vulnerability, but she gave surgeons a pass. She said, "Well, certain people, such as surgeons and airplane pilots, they don't need to be vulnerable. They just need to be technical." And I. I realize that's not entirely true. You know, we, first of all, if you deprive yourself of that vulnerability, you kind of cut off a lot of your own personal experience and the richness of your personal experience. And the second thing is that vulnerability informs your decision making and what you do. I think if we tend to treat people in uh, as object as objects and detach ourselves and depersonalize them, then we do things to people that we wouldn't necessarily want done to us. And we tr start to treat, you know, there's a, there's a big tendency I find in medicine of, of uh, making it transactional and making it economically based and driven by procedures. You know, surgeons are often, you know, driven by a, a desire to be productive. And I think it's important to always keep the patient uh, in mind and their experience. And you, if you don't allow yourself to be vulnerable, you won't be able to do that. So I searched for an alternative to being armored and defended. And a friend of mine, Dr. Helen Rice, uh, who is a psychiatrist at Harvard, was actually very helpful. And she told me about emotional agility. And this allows for a range of conflicting emotions. So instead of being walled off and defended and protected, you can experience the highs and the lows. You can feel emotions and you can also switch gears and be able to um, do what needs to be done and pra in practice. 
So emotional agility is a better option and life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. So I think this is one of the take home messages that, you know, it, the, the beauty of life is, is based a lot in the delicacy of life. And so understanding that and appreciating that actually enriches one's experience and doesn't deprive us of, from it. Uh, so this is a book uh, by Susan David about emotional agility, which I think is a, is a good um, roadmap or way of, of trying to develop these characteristics. I'd also say that it's not an easy thing to do. You know, you don't set, like flip a switch and go, well, I'm getting rid of the armor and I'm going to become emotionally agile. It's something to strive for. It's a way to try to live. It's not a simple thing to just do. And one of the things I think is in inherent in this, I think we as physicians, particularly as neurosurgeons, uh, tend to be very self-critical, very self-critical uh, and also critical of others, perfectionistic. And those things work against our um, emotional agility. So one of the things that's important is we have to have self-compassion. We have to recognize that we are going to make errors, that in errors are inevitably a part of what we do. We have to admit to them. We have to be uh, willing to communicate uh, with patients honestly, and we have to be able to forgive ourselves. And I think a lot of people get hung up on the forgiveness or the recognition of, of, of error and failure. So empathy and agility can both be taught. And this is what Dr. Rice was talking about in the empathy effect. You can learn to be more empathetic. So I guess I feel a bit like um, I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle. You know, here I am, the neurosurgeon who is probably, as a group of doctors, not really known for their empathy and their compassion and their humanity, talking to a bunch of doctors who are probably much more in tune with those things. So I'm kind of a little bit you know, aware that uh, so who am I to talk about this? And yet at the same time, I feel that that is um, that whether or not you are empathetic or start with empathy, uh, you can develop greater empathy. You can develop greater compassion. And if you're willing to learn and willing to develop those skills, they can be taught. So one of the things I learned from my sister's experience was that, um, you know, they were very different deaths. So my sister had... Um, uh, she was aware until the end. She was awake. Uh, she died of a cardiac arrest after an episode of sepsis. But what happened with her was that she, uh, very early after her bone marrow transplant, her platelet count dropped. And then it became clear that her uh, leukemic cells had come back and they really had nothing to offer her. But instead of saying, hey, you know, we really don't have anything to offer, you know, and being aware and being upfront with the fact that she was likely to die, they uh, her doctors substituted different kinds of chemotherapy, and so it kind of keeps the help the hope alive. And yet, it wasn't really honest because the focus was all on the treatments and the techniques and the technology, and not really on what was going on with her. And so, I think we always have to guard against that. It's easier, and you know, we're we're compensated to do something, right? And to sit that back and say, well, we really can't do anything or or, um, or we need to stop and maybe uh, rethink things uh, is super important. Now, I, it, I have um, an experience recently with my um, father-in-law who has uh, multiple myeloma and went into a protocol with Dr. Tuckman in, at UNC. And he had a very difficult time in his first um, treatment. And uh, they were all hopeful. This was kind of last stage, last ditch uh, chemotherapy. And after one ep one treatment, Dr. Tuchman sat down with him and said, you know, this isn't working. We need to stop. And I was really pleased by that because that was honest and showed integrity and showed, and it allowed them to transition toward hospice and, and, and an alternative care path. And then with my brother-in-law, um, when he was sick, he had no awareness. So he had he was in a coma from the outset. He had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. He was on Coumadin because of a um, prosthetic heart valve. So he had a bad hemorrhage. He, he had surgery uh, and he never woke up. But it was interesting to experience as a neurosurgeon what it was like to be on the receiving end of that care. And also the decision-making. I was his healthcare power of attorney. So I had to make decisions on withdrawing treatment and um, and and letting him um, letting him die. 
So we talk about burnout uh, in physicians and um, you know, there's an, a lot of burnout and there's a lot of reasons for burnout. But one of the things that I've recognized is that how we handle our, these intense emotions and whether we defend ourselves against them or allow them into our lives, I think that there's a, there's a real negative long-term consequence to people when they don't, when they wall themselves off, when they try to distance themselves from the suffering and the experiences of others, and they try to pre prevent that seeping in. Because I, I came to realize that doesn't work. You know, you can't really, the wall is permeable. And the problem is if you don't, if you don't acknowledge the grief of the passing of a patient and you just bury it, it still comes back. It starts, it's corrosive. It starts to affect and to negatively impact you as a person in, in your life. And so I think that one of the things that I recognize, and I, I'm, I'm not naive enough to sit here and say there aren't major system issues or the way we deliver healthcare that are causing burnout, because I think there definitely are. But I do feel that how we live within ourselves and, and um, provide care for others and for ourselves and for our families and experiencing the emotions and whether we defend ourselves against them is an important cause of burnout. So I wanted to talk about my writing. And I, you know, I started writing after my sister, um, my sister got sick. And it was interesting because when I was in college, I want, I took a writing class in I said to the teacher, you know, I want to be a writer. And he said, well, you got nothing to say. <laughs> and then I said, he said, so go ahead and live a little and then, and then maybe you'll have something to say. So then, you know, all this happened and I felt, um, I felt like I wanted to, um, I wanted to write and I wanted to give my sister's uh, words um, a, a place. I didn't want them to die, you know, for her journal just to fade away and not be recognized. So I wrote, uh, um, and one thing I think is a quality of mine is dogged persistence, which is I just basically kept going and I got rejection after rejection after rejection and, uh, and just kept going. So I've written in uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, World Neurosurgery and Journal of Palliative Medicine. And then I wrote this, the book. Um, and I wrote it, I did everything backwards and wrong, okay? I discovered that um, I, I wrote a book and then I rewrote it and I rewrote it and I rewrote it. And then I tried to find an agent and uh, they no one would answer my letters. And then finally I found, I went to a course at Harvard uh, for physician writers and um, met an agent. And she said, well, what you need to do is you need to do it entirely differently. You need to uh, write a proposal instead of the, and, and not the book, and it needs to not be a memoir. She said, you know, you're basically not a celebrity. Nobody's really interested in you and what your story is. Uh, you need to write a book about of prescriptive nonfiction, taking your experience and uh, making it instructive and providing examples and reasons for people uh, to pay attention and to uh, think differently. So using it as a kind of launching pad for uh, a bigger more universal message. And I actually think that was extremely helpful advice. Um, so Linda Connor was this agent and I pitched it to her and she said, well, you got to do everything differently. And I did. And I followed her advice. And then she said she would represent me. And then she sent it around to 60 publishers. And finally, one publisher uh, picked it up. And, um, and then it, and what was nice at that point was it was going to be a trade paperback. And instead of a trade paper, they said, well, we really think this is important and we're going to make it a hardcover. And then they said, and we'd like to put in photos. So every time that there was a chance of like uh, making it cheaper, they went they went bigger. And I was really grateful to them uh, for that. Um, and so it, it actually was a very positive experience. You know, I, I worked with an editor and we rewrote the book literally 10 times. And then uh, when we sent it to the publisher and I sent it to the publisher and their, their editor um, wrote back and said that she had no changes, that it was fine the way it was, and that that was the first time in 170 books she'd reviewed for publication that she didn't want to make any changes. It's like, wow, that was pretty cool. So in the New York Times, you know, I wrote an article called Grief is My Guide, How My Sister Made Me a Better Doctor, also about moral distress in neurosurgery and dying in the neuro ICU. And the Washington Post, there was an article about uh, doctors and their responses to COVID and another uh, article about 
a friend of mine who was a an ER physician who had just retired, who came in with a glioblastoma that I, and I did surgery on him and about how um, empathy was an in, incredibly important part of that journey. And then also looking and saying, you know, one of the things I look at and say is instead of, oh, these are the things, everyone can make a catalog of what we're doing wrong and how we're, and how things are not the way they should be. But this last article about tackling racial disparities in cancer care by creating new ways for institutions to function was an article about how to address some of these issues in a positive way. I also wrote in uh, academic uh, journals, an editorial uh, in world neurosurgery that compassion belongs in the operating room and in the journal of palliative medicine, why should a neurosurgeon attend a palliative care conference anyway? So one of the things I did after writing this book, you know, I advocate for, um, for palliative care and the importance of hospice and palliative care. And then I recognized that I really, you know, didn't know enough about it to be the champion of that. And so I went and took uh, training in palliative medicine uh, through a course at Harvard uh, University. And, and um, it's called a course called Palliative Care Education and um, Practice. And I'll talk about it more in the next uh, session. But I thought it was, I felt like a fish out of water a little bit. Here's a neurosurgeon in a palliative care conference. And what was I doing there? But I thought it was, it was very useful. And I'm glad I did it. So compassion must drive patient care and health systems. And I think this is one of the, one of the sticking points with um, my experience is that if you become more open and you recognize the importance of emotional impacts, you also start to recognize when systems aren't functioning as they should, or the demands on you are not attainable. So I think there's, there is, um, what comes with that is that increased awareness is probably perhaps some increased frustration when things aren't being done right or could be done better. And that poses its own challenges. So I wanted to share with you, uh, John Rosenthal lives in Chapel Hill and uh, wrote this book, Searching for Amy Lou Danzer. And it's about a young woman who uh, killed herself. He, he was very good friends with her as a young man and she killed herself. And he wrote a book about what her life would be like after uh, if she had lived. And one of the questions I have, or, you know, as, as I've begun teaching and working with medical students is, you know, would I have been receptive to the lessons of compassion that I learned in the experiences that I faced um, if I, when I'd been younger, you know, would a medical student or would someone who's not really first had firsthand experience with grief and suffering, how aware would they be? How open would they be to those, to that learning? And so John and I were talking about this and he wrote something back to me, which I thought was very powerful. And he said, because I was talking to, I've been talking to medical students and he said, I doubt that they are, were, that they are mature enough to appreciate your message, but that's probably because that's not the way any of us learn things. The young, young poet Kate Keats said it well, axioms in philosophy are not axioms until they are proved upon our pulses. I'm sure you had heard about the need for compassion in medicine before Victoria's diagnosis. And I'm equally sure you were always a pretty compassionate guy, but to grasp it as a medical necessity, well, that took her dying. Still, I'll bet your words will linger, and lingering, they may come into their own someday, when life teaches these young people to become aware of their own emotional limitations. I suppose it all has to do with the thickness of the armor in which one is encased. The very fact that you learned so much on that journey with your sister suggests that your armor was by no means thick and impenetrable. So. In the next talk, I want to talk about the ways that um, I have tried to grow in my practice and to as another uh, preventive for burnout. Uh, and that includes training in palliative care. Uh, I'm very involved in an organization called One World, Neur One World Surgery, which does uh, surgery in Honduras and Dominican Republic and also in teaching. But I think that I will stop and we can turn it open to questions. So the floor is yours. Questions or comments?
I'll start us off. Dr. Stern, thank you so much, first of all, for sharing more of your story and, and how you know your own practice changed. I'm, I'm curious from being a being a family member and, and going through your sister's uh, story, was there, can you talk about maybe one thing you did differently when working with patients and families in your own practice after that experience? I, I think you brought up that that big theme in general, but I was curious if if there was maybe even just one specific story that you could share about speaking well, or approaching things differently when you when you work with patients after after your sister's experience. Well, I think so. It's, I've really um, tried to be much more present with patients and to learn about them. I'll ask um, generally about their lives and their experiences and what matters to them. I'm less, I try to be less, um, you know, authoritative or giving a lot of, if you look at a lot of um, medical patient, uh, doctor patient interactions, they tend to be one-way streets with a lot of information dumping and kind of um, talking to patients rather than listening. So I think I, I try to listen more. There, The article that in the New York Times on, um, was, Kind of right after my sister had died, um, the I had this young woman who was in for she had metastatic breast cancer and um, it had spread to her um, central nervous system, so she needed a reservoir to be placed for chemotherapy. And I, you know, so it was a technical assignment, right? I needed to put a reservoir in to be able to give the chemotherapy. But I kind of sat there and said, you know, I'm. First of all, I'm really sorry about what you're going through. And I actually started, you know, it's, I started to cry when I was talking to her because she, um, she, she, uh, she reminded me of my sister, but also I kind of saw as if the, you know, this is not a technical issue. Yes, there's a technical thing that needs to be done, but the reality is this young woman is dying and the chemotherapy isn't going to cure her. And we're trying to help, but we're not really going to make that much of a difference. And she said, she said that she, she was a, a fourth grade teacher. And she said that her um, goal was to be able to finish the, the year with her students. And she had like two more weeks to go. And would that be all right? And I, you know, normally I would say, well, you know, we need to get this in, you know, you know, your doctors want this, the chemotherapy to be given. And I said, I, I think that's fine. You know, go ahead. And that's super important to you. So go ahead and achieve that goal. And we'll, we'll work around your schedule. Um, and recognizing that, that, that her life experiences were far more important than when we put a tube in her head to be able to give chemotherapy. So I think, I think that um, a, I guess this is maybe something that comes just with a little bit of age in medicine is that you start to recognize that the procedures are not um, the be all and end all of what we do and that how they fit in with patients' lives and experiences is, is crucial. And a lot of times, you know, we don't prioritize. We're so used to just, you know, trying to do the tasks and being task oriented and kind of looking at specific assignments and not taking a step back and going, does this really matter or what's really important here or how do I really honor uh, this, this patient and their desires and interests and, and what would be best for them. So I think listening, being present, um, being uh, makes a big difference. So that I think is from my sister. And I think there's also an interesting thing which, about empathy, which is, you know, I look and I say the easy empathy is the people, you know, that, that remind you of the people you know and care about. And the harder empathy is like people you have a hard time being empathetic with um, and I, re I remember there was this guy, he was in, um, he was in the ICU and he came in with a headache and he was a homeless guy, um, who had a metastatic, uh, lung cancer and was, um, uh, had, it had spread to his brain and he kept coming into the hospital and then they discharged him and then he'd come right back in again. And so I sat down and I talked to him, I said, you know, cause, 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 he was worried that, you know, the brain tumor is getting worse and that that was the problem. But from a medical standpoint, you know, he wasn't dying from it any more rapidly. It wasn't ca causing him, um, you know, worsening symptoms. He, he was he was anxious and afraid and he felt sort of dismissed because like the ER doc said, oh, well, brain tumor, check, go to neurosurgery. Neurosurgery says, you know, well, not my patient uh, could be a problem or gets admitted to the medicine service. And there was this kind of, you know, 
the 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 wheel was spinning and so he was continually being readmitted and yet there really wasn't anything changing so I, I remember sitting and talking to him and I talked to him about like what was his favorite kind of cigarette and how often did he smoke and kind of you know like what instead of like oh you shouldn't smoke smoking's bad for you you know it's, it, it's gonna be cancer it's like well tell me about yourself what 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 do you care about you know and and actually we became pretty friendly and you know we, we talked a lot about um that and that kind of led to sort of fear and his anxiety about dying and i said you know we we so he had kind of had an honest discussion you know we didn't do surgery we he didn't need surgery um but you know i just feel like the the conveyor belt of the care that we provide you know diagnose a brain tumor get a surgery get a radiation treatment and off you go you know to the next person and everybody sort of passes the person along and and it and i think stopping and saying hey let's really look at um at what you need or what you want or who you are so i think that might that's kind of maybe a lesson from my sister thanks dr stern thank you oh. winston can i ask a question sure. thank you so much for sharing um I'm Jen McEntee. I'm a hospitalist and palliative care doctor um, and a member of AOE. So thank you for being here today. And what you what you talk about rings so true to many of us palliative care providers on this call. I think something that you mentioned really early on in your presentation is something that um, BJ Armstrong talks a lot about in regards who is the founder of the Zen Hospice Unit out in San Francisco is the aesthetics of medicine and how unesthetically pleasing our hospital systems are, mm -hmm. right? We kind of strip, we strip them, the hospital systems and our care system and the patients of their senses a little bit and what pleases them and what gives them rewards in regards to their dopaminergic system and their brain. What, what changes do you think we could make in a big, quaternary tertiary care academic center in regards to making the hospital systems more aesthetically pleasing? Well, I, I have a, a chapter in the book about that. Um, and um, so that's something I do address. And, and one of the thing is, one of the things is, and you see this in really nice hospitals where um, bringing nature in, um, you know, people heal better if they are connected with nature. I talk in the book about, um, you know, in our local community um, that we created a healing garden at the cancer center, which is used by the staff and by the patients. And so bringing nature back into uh, care and, and treatment, I think is super important. When my sister um, was sort of locked away in her uh, isolation unit, she brought in these big um, posters of her family. So she had pictures of her family and that was very important for keeping her grounded. And so I, I think that um, we could easily have um, uh, like you could come in with like a flash drive of photographs of your family or your favorite music or something we could and we could have that projected, you know, because because when you look at the ICU or the or, you know, the inpatient units, it's monitors and beeping. And if you look and you say all these people are absolutely fixated on their heart rate and we as physicians know it doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, if your heart rate drops and stays low or goes high and stays up, then that's a problem, right? But we, but people are constantly on edge thinking that the blood pressure changes are important or the heart rate changes are important and they're kind of irrelevant. So we've let the machines dominate and we've taken away the human aspect. So I look and I say, well, why don't we have um, the uh, projection of their favorite photos? Um, and why don't we have a soundtrack of their favorite music? And you could play that all the time. The other thing is if you're in the hospital at all hours of the day and night, it's ungodly noisy. You know, why is it so loud? And so one of the things I talk about in my book is, well, look at look at how um, the kind of chain of the sequence of managing um, beeping IVs. It's just so it's absolutely idiocy, right? You know, your 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 antecubital vein occludes, your 
it goes off, it beeps, it signals a nurse, the person's terrified, the nurse may come, the nurse may not come, then they readjust you, then they reset the or the alarm, and it goes, you could make that all soundless, right? It could all be based on wi wireless communication that it trips a, you know, pager on the nurse, it doesn't have to alarm, you know, and then the person could, it could come, the, they could come back. There's so many ways that the patient experience could be improved if you make the patient the center of the care rather than the object that we're so much of the hospital is organized on the convenience of the providers of the care and not on the um, sanctity of the patient. You know, why are people woken so up true. all day, all night? Why are we doing all these things to people? They certainly don't help them, you know, and everybody's kind of working on a on a, um, a lot of fear, right? I'm afraid if I don't get their vitals by this time that's required in my shift, then I'm going to get in trouble, right? So they get the vitals, but they may not be necessary and you may not need to wake the patient. So there's a ton of things that we could do better and should do better. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, um, along that lines, we have implemented at UNC a meet my loved one document, which is based on like dignity care and dignity therapy, um, during the pandemic for that exact reason, because parent patients couldn't come in. They were getting, our patients, family members couldn't come in. They were getting delirious. And so pallet at UNC pallet of care team implemented this document, which talks about like, what makes you human? What, what do you value? Who's important to you? What music do you listen to? What kind of food do you like? And can your family send us pictures so we can put them in your room? I think it's And so great. we're still, we actually, we studied that document and, um, we are actually implementing it system-wide. So, so many, so many of these things are, are, are low hanging fruit. They don't, they don't cost. So it's true. just, it's a different perspective on how you deliver care and how you, how you value patients and how you value their um, kind of well being. And actually, because the, the irony is that so many of the things that we do to people damages their well being. And yes, you're doing these treatments, but if the overall experience is in the ICU is I stayed up for seven days and I am miserable you've not done any favors, you know, and, and the thing about compassion, if you guys have read um, compassionomics, or if you haven't, I encourage you to do, but if you look at, you say, um, people, when they leave the hospital, what they remember is whether the care was compassionate or not. They don't remember all of the procedures. Like we're focused as a neurosurgeon, I'm focused on the effectiveness and efficiency and the quality of my surgical procedure. But that's because I got a bug about that. My patient wants to know that we cared about them, that they felt like they were valued, that we um, appreciated them. And so much of care, the, the metrics of what we're looking at and saying how we value what we do versus how patients feel valued, they're, they're, they're not even on the same page. They're in different, they're in different parts of the universe. And so Bringing those together, you know, one of the things I did in my book was I interviewed, um, pay, I interviewed, um, I didn't talk about this, but I interviewed uh, a bunch of pay, uh, doctors who were patients and also patients and their experiences. And one of the things that was, I, I was kind of pleased with was I had a, as an interview with a patient that I took out a brain tumor in him. And um, six years later, I went back, or maybe five years later, I went back and I interviewed him about he had weakness afterwards, you know, so it was a successful surgery. We took out a grade three um, uh, glioma from his um, supplemental motor area. And so he did have some weakness afterwards um, and he survived and he did well. So by all accounts, this would be a completely positive surgery, right? But it really messed up his life, you know, because he was an organist and he couldn't play the organ like he used to. So he was not able to play music like he did. And so he's very, and it was just interesting for me to talk to a patient like six years down the road of a complication or not, I mean, it's not a complication because it's all, it was all correctly done, but the impacts of his care and to hear from him how what I had done had totally changed his life. And I feel like, you know, we, we look at the other thing we do with patients is we look at episodes of care, right? We're just doing this kind of brief thing. There's lot, not as much longitudinal care. So I think uh, there's lots of ways of improving what we do. So if a neurosurgeon gets this, I'm sure you all are, are way ahead of me. Thanks so much, Jody, for highlighting all this stuff. And as you said, it's low hanging fruit in terms of relieving the suffering of others, which is kind of, <laughs> you know, the goal and the oh, really the only rationale for our, our existence in a practical sense. I, I was curious about what, ele what the elements of your... Um, you know, your third year student humanism program and your reflections on what it's added to 
to their experience and on how they've received it. Well, that's like a that's like a um, teeing up for the next talk, right? You know, stay tuned. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you that um, that the I what I've done, and I'll talk a little more about this. But what I've done is I've you know introduced the essays that I've written and other writings, and you know they read them, and then I say like. Um, what is um, your experience of, say, moral distress? Have you experienced moral distress? Have you experienced, um, uh, you know, what do you think about the level of compassion um, that is that is shown to patients? And what is amazing to me is that they have, they all have experiences in all of these areas. And I think that medical students generally um, don't feel that they have a voice in these areas. They don't feel like they have a safe space to actually talk about these things. And they really uh, impact and color their own experiences. So I've learned um, that it's really important and um, that, you know, we we meet the same, the same group meets uh, repeatedly. And uh, so we have some, um, they're very um, willing to listen to each other. Um, and they, they need that kind of support. And I'm struck by the trajectory of um, training and um, practice that people come in idealistic and think that they can solve all these problems. And, and then for a variety of reasons, that sort of gets beaten out of them a little bit. And I look and I go, what's happening in our training and our practice that people are coming in idealistic and leaving burned out and feeling like um, they can't make a difference, you know, and why as educators are we not addressing those concerns and giving voice to those so that you can kind of address this as you go. So I feel uh, privileged. I would love to do this more. So, because I think it's super important, but the whole, and that's one of the things that was so great listening to uh, Frank Wilson, when he's talking about, you know, the humanity and teaching literature. You know, um, the, uh, one of the things I'd love to do, I've uh, been studying narrative medicine. And the other thing is, you know, like the death of Ivan Illich and all these very, very um, beautiful um, descriptions of death and dying and medical care. You know, we, we need to, uh, we don't need to reinvent all this. It's all out there. We need to give that voice. I was talking to a professor at Columbia and I said, you know, I'd like to teach the medical students and, and she said, well, we don't have time in our curriculum, you know, and what's funny is my son is, he, he'll be mad if he hears, I'm talking about him, but he, but he's, he's a second, now second year student at the University of Michigan. And I'm just, I'm listening to him talking to about his curriculum and it's all like the first year was relentless basic science and no, and no humanistic qualities of being a doctor at all. And I'm looking going, <laughs> the, the curriculum is out of whack. You know, why, why is that how you're teaching people? You bring, you select them as hyper-competitive overachievers, and then you kind of uh, make them take these tests after test after test and absorb and memorize, but you're not uh, cultivating the humanism. Why is that? What, what are we doing? And why is that, why is that happening? Yeah, I agree. As you know, I teach electives and compassion in, to first year students and fourth year students. And um, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And the fourth year students find they're being introduced to these concepts. <laughs> uh, I think that there's there's a need. One of the things that I learned in the palliative care uh, course that I talk, uh, took was there's a real need for having a peer group that you can actually sit and really kind of brainstorm and discuss things, let down your guard, you know, and kind of process things. Uh, for me, the writing has been important for that, but I feel like there's that is a crucial thing that we need to um, provide for our students, that kind of longitudinal, um, evaluative, um, you know, safe place to talk about what's going on. You know, I had one student talk to me about how it, he just witnessed his first death um, and, you know, and nobody talked about it and nobody did anything about it and they just moved on to the next patient. And that sends a very confusing signal. Like, what are we saying about dying? Why aren't we actually just sitting and talking about how that makes you feel? You know, like what is, um, what is, th that has to be done. You know, if you want, if you want your end product, you want to have um, humanistic, humane physicians, um, that's something you have to cultivate. And that's not something you're going to learn from um, memorizing the Krebs cycle again. So, Ken, I'm a big fan of what you're doing. 
Thanks. I think I it, this love, highlights I, also, oh, go ahead. No, you're fine. I think it highlights the need for me of actually implementing palliative care um, into the curriculum, like on day mm -hmm. one of medical school um, and implementing it more during their earlier years because a lot of us palliative care providers talk and preach and teach about compassion, burnout, compassion, fatigue, being vulnerable, um, and actually good listening skills, right? We, we're all trained in that. And so I think, and Winston is as well, <laughs> if we can indeed bring some of those core set values of palliative care into the curriculum early on and, you know, coil it through our curriculum, um, I think it's well needed. Um, and the our needs assessment shows that from our students, but um, well, it would be nice to figure out how to advocate for that. So that's one of the things that I, I'm also gonna talk about in the next um, part, uh, but but one of the things that I find, um, and I guess one of the reasons I felt like I wasn't just a dead weight in the uh, palliative care training program is there's this, there's this real um, bizarre cutoff in medical care where like, okay, the neurosurgeon surgeon is treating and then they say, well, now we're not getting anywhere then bring in palliative care. And it's like palliative care needs to be from the outset and the decision-making needs to be informed by those principles and those ideas. And, um, you know, when I was at, my brother-in-law died at UCLA and um, we got to see palliative care um, when, after we had decided to stop. And then it was basically um, kind of um, very, nice funeral planning okay but the thing is it was just messed up it should have been right at the outset so i tried in my in my own institution i i said i want to have uh palliative care embedded in the neurosurgical icu so that all of these decisions are being made real time as we go through the patient care and um because there's 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 tremendous variety between like what an the different attendings, what they recommend, the courses for patients, and they shouldn't, that shouldn't be up to the attending. You shouldn't decide, you know, what you're going to do based on or how patients are treated based on which attending you get. There should be some standardization of that, of that interaction. But I feel like the, the whole um, connection with palliative care needs to be broadened and brought in much more in the acute setting, because once you get put into the hospice and palliative care path, I think it's great. But the problem is you get it put in too late and it's not integrated into the acute care decision making. I think you agree, huh? So does ASCO, so do oncologists. ASCO guidelines say at the stage of diagnosis for metastatic cancer, palliative care could be involved. I think my goal, or maybe should be involved, I think is what their guideline says. My goal, I think, is what I said kind of tongue in cheek, but not really, is one of the highlights of my career is when a third year resident in internal medicine came up to me when I was talking to a medical student about palliative care and said, Dr. McEntee, didn't we all enter medicine to do palliative care? And it's so true. We all did. Right. So how do we teach us go right. back to the roots of how do we teach everybody to do palliative care 101 so that we can provide better patient-centered care, goal concordant care to all of our patients? Also, I feel like I I should not have had to go through the crisis that I went with, through with my sister to suddenly realize I needed to be more human. You know, that should have been, and I think if those skills had been provided and that education had been provided, I might not have been able to take full advantage of it from a personal experiential level, but I would have had the, the toolkit or the skills to reach to or know who to go to or you not feel so alone. And so like, I'm doing this for the first time, kind of, you know, I'm, why am I having to figure this out for myself? Why is this something that I, um, I don't have the resources to, to an understanding um, of through my training? Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. Um, flew by, but I want to thank our audience for their time and attention, maybe some of you during your lunch break, and to thank Dr. Stern, of course, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. The big takeaway team is that there is a part two. Uh, this evening at 5 p.m., Dr. Stern graciously will return and really will share more about his thoughts on professionalism and preventing burnout. Well, and I also think it's it's actually a really good fit because it's about education and it's about um, palliative care and all and all these other things. Um, and I so I think it I think it really kind of 
comes out, it, it furthers this discussion. Makes Thanks. Sense.